This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thank you very much. The title is a little bit cut off, but it says Scientific Python Tools for Non-Scientific Users. Uh, uh, who of you uses Scientific Python Tools? Uh, one, two, so that's good. Because that's for the audience that doesn't use Scientific Python Tools yet. Uh, Python is an amazing language because it's used in many, many different fields and communities, which is pretty unique, I would say, for general purpose programming language. So DevOps web programmers are the Usually suspects, you would say, sysadmins use them, database programmers, but also a lot of scientists and engineers. So I, I teach Python for a living, and I teach a lot of different people, so many of them actually you can categorize in the last group, scientists and engineers. And there's a large ecosystem out there of tools. And it's amazing because I'm changing between different communities, and as I see different communities teams use different tools, and very often they don't know much about the other communities or sub-communities, as you might call them, and what tools they use. Um, and it might be interesting to know a little bit about the other tools because you might be able to use them for maybe unintended usages that they're not actually designed for from the beginning, but they can still be useful for other purposes. So there are many, many scientific libraries, actually many thousands of scientific libraries. Of course, I cannot... I don't even know all of them. I know quite few of them and use them for many years. So NumPy is the most basic one, which is about numerical arrays. SciPy is a big collection of a lot of scientific tools. Matplotlib is a plotting library. But I want to focus on two of these uh, libraries. One of them is Jupyter Notebook, and the other one is Pandas. And I want to just give you a very, very short overview. Uh, typically, I teach courses that take at least half a day to cover the basics of these things. So obviously, if I have 25 minutes, I cannot go into much detail. So the Jupyter Notebook uh, is a very interesting kind of tool. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid of an interactive prompt, so everything you know from an interactive prompt. And but at the same time, it can be stored as a script. It offers a lot of things. So it's, it's much better than the inter interactive prompt in terms of tab completion, help, and all kind of stuff. Uh, it itself is safe as a JSON format, so you can look inside and you can version control it because it's just plain text JSON. And then you have cells. We will look at the cell in a minute. And you have typically code cells, markdown tells cells, or raw text cells. And you have a lot of things like magic commands. So it goes way beyond Python. It gives you a lot of other tools. For instance, for timing, how long things take, for profiling. You can have cells in size, and you can have HTML cells, you can have LaTeX cells. You can have a lot of things. OK, so um, what are they good for? Notebooks are good for quick experiments. So you can work very similar to the interactive prompt, but you have a much more powerful multi-line adding facilities. In addition to Python code, you can add all kinds of formatted texts, diagrams, links, tables, and so on. And you can find out how fast the algorithm is with just one line of code. You can use them as documentations. People use notebooks actually to write reports with this included uh, uh, active Python code. You can make slides. These slides are made with a notebook, for instance, and much more. So let's have a look uh, at a at a, in a notebook, so I, I prepare the notebook. Typically, I like to uh, um, make those notebooks live, but of course, there's not enough time. So I have a Jupyter notebook example, and it looks like this. So this is a notebook, so you open a new notebook. You have something called a dashboard that looks like this. You see all kind of notebooks. The green ones are the active ones. And these are running, and this is a cell. This is, for instance, a markup cell. If we click inside, you will see a lot of interesting things. You can change the cell type of the thing. And then you have a markup cell, and you can use all kinds of markup. You're probably familiar with Markdown, I'm sorry. This is a markup language called Markdown. And it's pretty nice because you can also include HTML if you like, but typically it's enough to have very simple text. And you have something like this. And then inside the notebook, you have magic commands. Actually, I should put a percent sign in front of it. And then you have like an ls command, which gives you an ls. And of course, it doesn't work because I probably killed the something, but it, it should, then it just goes a notebook as it is, and, um, and it gives you a, a listing of the, of, of the current directory, and it works, so right, right now it doesn't work, I need to restart the server, I guess. And then you have 
all kinds of aliases. You might or might make it a bit bigger here, so you can see better. Here, so you have all kinds of aliases. These are commands you can type in, and you get a feedback. Um, you can use this magic command time it, as you can see if you say time it one plus one, it uses the time in built in module, but when you, you can use it yourself, but it's pretty cumbersome, you have to import it, you have to generate a string and a namespace, all kind of stuff here. You just have this magic command and it gives you a timing of something that is very convenient. For instance, you can also uh, use prun, which ob obviously it's not working now because uh, this would use uh, this, the Python C profiler and would give you an output of this uh, Thing, but, but it's still hanging here. I probably have to say kernel restart, which restarts my kernel. Uh, and then it should also, this works now. I restart my kernel, and if I do this, uh, have this very stupid function, which I need to execute first before I can use it. And then you see now it gives me this output, which is the output from C profile, and you can do some profiling just with this prun. And this prun itself takes a lot of subcommands. So if I, I can uh, include a cell and I say percent prun question mark when I get a very long help, and it works just like a command line tool with a lot of options. So you can kind of set all kind of things if you want. Very very convenient. It, it's exactly the same functionality as you would get with C profiler, but instead of writing three, four, five lines of Python code, you can do everything in one line with a tool. So it makes it very convenient for all kinds of things. If you like to, you can have LaTeX cells, you can HTML cells, and many others. There's also a lot of extensions. People can write extensions, and you can create like a Sison cell, so you can execute Sison. You can have a Fortran cell. You can do pretty much anything you want by writing an extension, which is not very difficult. So you can take advantage of the notebook. Also, you have more detailed exceptions. So the default exception here, if I have a stupid function, divide, and I divide one by zero, which gives me exception. You see this exception is extended. You get some context information, and you can set the mode to verbose. And now if I do the same thing in verbose mode, then you get even the locals and the globals. And most of the time, this is good enough to debug your application. So it's a very rich environment for a lot of tools, and it's very nice. It's not for writing big applications, but it's very good for experimenting. You want to try something out. How does it work? If I index in the list, how does a list generation, uh, 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 list comprehension work, and so on. This is something you can do with a notebook, and they always have a notebook open to try things out. If you import something and I put a question mark behind something, I get a help. Yeah? If I say import uh, sys, yeah? and then I put sys question mark, I get a very extensive help. And if you have the source code available, then you put two question marks and it will show the source code also. So this is a notebook and I use it, it's especially good for teaching because I can type things and at the end I can give my notebook to the user because the content is actually, um, uh, this, note, this very notebook I'm, I'm doing here. And the call tip doesn't work, and I want to show you. And now it shows you. So if I do less, you can see this is just a basic JSON document, which is very easy. It's very easy to understand. You can version control it and something. OK, this would be the Jupyter Notebook. You can spend several days on all the features if you like, but it would be the basic, basic features. Let's continue with our presentation. So this would be the notebook. Uh, the next thing was a notebook demo I just did. It's Pandas. So Pandas is a tool for data analysis. It's a very big tool. It's based on NumPy, it uses NumPy, or it's also inspired by R and other tools. And it can be very useful for a lot of things. And it can do a lot. But maybe two very interesting features are the one it can read and write all kinds of formats. So it's very good at reading CSV, everything that's, that you might call CSV. Actually, the CSV reader has 54 different options. You can read all kinds of CSVs with all kinds of things. And also, but also has the SQL backend. You can SQL, uh, you can use SQL databases, can read Excel, it can read HDF5 and many other formats. And it can export these formats. And another thing that is, is very good is very good is working with non-defined data. What's very good not the numbers. So if you have missing data somewhere, then Pandas is, is very good. Yeah? So I have an example here, again, 
a pandas example that looks like this. So here I have uh, actually, uh, as an example, what you can do with it, which is not intended for reading an Apache log file, or reading an Apache log file with the thing. So this is, looks like this is just a plain Apache simple example log file, with some uh, IP number, some data, and some other information about it. And this is the full code. So actually, this is a full code. You can write the full code in here and you can actually read it in. So I will step through very quickly, line by line, or like this, and you get back what's called the pandas data frame, which looks like this, and you see you get a kind of formatted output, and this is actual data written in, and you see this is a time actually converted into a, a daytime object inside the pandas, the IP address, uh, the request, the status, and the size, which is a floating point number in this case. Okay, uh, just go quickly step by step to give, give you a kind of a feel what this, what this can do. So you can read a CSV file, you have to give the file name, uh, you sk skip the header so it doesn't use the first line as a header, so it's a header none, and you say delimit white space because the default delimiter would be a comma. So if I do this and I do a head as here, it reads in the thing and just, since I didn't specify a header, it just comes up as numbers for the header and reads it in, but see everything is split, but it also reads this dashes here I don't want here, and splits my date at the place which is not supposed to be split, but we can fix this later. So, and now I can uh, also say, okay, I only want to use columns 0, 3, 4, 5, and 6, so I skip the columns, those two dashes here, and also I can specify the names I want to call it. It's the same order, so the first one would be this, would be the IP, the second one would be the time, the time offset with this one. And so on. So if I do this, as you can see here now, it looks like this. I have a header and I have this. It's still not very nice. So now I need to write the helper function that helps me to parse the date. Sometimes you need to have something like this. And this would be a function that gets the date string and the offset and would take, take this apart. You would get this part and this part. And you see this and this. And then I do some manipulations with date time and generate date with a, with a, with a time zone with an offset. So we don't have to go to the details here. It's doing something, and this would be a test. So if I put this in, I get this daytime object out. Yeah. And now I have to do this is not only for one daytime, but for the whole column. And that's typically how Pandas works. It works for all columns at the same time, which in some places gives you very light speed up because you can vectorize these operations. In this case, not really because there's a lot of text processing. So now I have to actually register my function here as a parser, and I specify now my columns one and two, which contain those two parts, should be read together, and, be, and pandas hands over those values. And once I do this, in the end I have a log file in, as a table that looks like this, and now I have this numbers here, and you can see the status. Okay, that's reading it, but now the interesting part is actually looking at the data. So you get info, and then you get the, the, the types of the columns, strings or objects, that's an int, int64, that's a NumPy data, data type, so C kind of type, it's very interesting because the lot number saves a lot of space, because it's just a 64-bit integer, so it's eight bytes, compared to a Python integer, it is in Python 3, is 28 bytes, so it's a factor of three and a half more memory efficient for a starter. The same thing for float. And you see here as a daytime uh, 64 object, is a 64 uh, float, a 64-bit float-based daytime object, they are efficient, and also includes the time offset, this is my eight hours, minus eight hours here. Yeah. And now I can have our describe, which takes all the numerical columns and gives me basic statistics. It doesn't make too much sense maybe on the, on the status, yeah? but it makes sense on the size. You see how many you, you have, the count, you know, they're not, not everything has a size, obviously. You get the mean, the standard elevation, and so on, very quickly. This, this is very high-level command. And then I think the size became a float because there are some missing values in there and pandas turned them in not a number, not a number of floats. But it can handle not missing values, which can be very painful if you have to do it yourself. So it's very, very uh, powerful in handling missing values. And now we can do some operations. So I can figure out where I have no size. So this df size gives me the column size. And I can say where it is now, that would give me back a new vector of true and false, and only the ones are true I take, so I take only the one that where there, there's no size. Yeah? And I can check, there's 139 of them, there's no size. So various, the thing is, this, everything is vectorized, you don't write loops, and typically the things are very fast. A lot of, a lot of big parts of pandas is written in Sison, so you get close to C speed, this is very high level Python commands. 
And you can look at the head. The head gives you the first five entries all the time, per default, and you see they have a non-defined size. And you can also group by, this is one a very powerful command, you can group by the status, for instance, and then count. Then you see, uh, out of the no size, only one of them has the status 200, and most, uh, many of them have the status 304. You can do the same thing for all, so if you want to, you just group by status, and you say status count, and that gives you the count of all the Most of them have a 200, there's everything worked, and there's also five of them with a 404, and other statuses. Yeah, very quickly done. And the nice thing is, even if you have several hundred thousand entries, it will take way less than a second to get this command, typically. So it's very fast. And now you can just do a difference, and then you do a difference, it goes by the index. I kind of didn't talk about the index too much. So if you have the index, you see, uh, because this one has so many statuses, whereas my no size has just four, three of them, so it will fill the ones where it doesn't have data, but it's not a number. But now we can do a replace operation, so replace on the number with the, the status, and then you will get the status, for instance. So typically these operations are pretty rich, just one line does a lot. Typically when you write a loop, you would write two, three, four, five lines here, and everything is in one line, and I convert it to an integer, because I don't like a float. An integer would cut it off, but there are integers anyway, everything is dot zero here. Yeah. And you can do all kinds of filtering, so you can say, okay, I want to have all the good requests, so you say, okay, I need to, split. you see, if I, if I look at this table here, the, the, the requests look like this, it's a get, and then there's a URL address, so I need to split off my get here, so I have request.str gives me string methods, which are vectorized in the whole column, but they're exactly the same string method as in Python, and I split everything, and then take the first part. And if this is get, and at the same time the status is 200, I get the good ones. So this is not very nice, so I can make it a bit nicer. So actually I pop off the column request and split it into two sub-columns. And the first sub-column would be uh, the get or put, whatever, the type of the request, and the second one would be the URL. And that's what I'm doing. I pop it off the whole thing, and I make two new uh, columns and put them in. And now you see, now I have the request type and the request URL very easy. And the nice thing is this works for even very large, everything that fits in memory. So pandas is only for in memory, but typically if you have this machine, this it means quite a bit of data. And now I can do it easy, so it gives me all the types that are get and at the same time the status is 200, and I get the same result as before. Yeah. And a few more things you can do, you can say uh, data frame, DFS is data frame, yeah. status unique, it gives you unique numbers, and then also, if you like to, you can also find all the addresses that have a 4, four. and then if you say, this is a filter, this gives you all the 4, four true or false, and I can use this true or false filter with this location lock here, and then get the IP, and I get the IPs, where the status is 4, four. This is the index that's not interesting right now. Yeah? You can do way more, so DF, the data frame, if you look at this, has a lots and lots of uh, Lots of lots of attributes. So if you look at this, it has 430 attributes. You're not going to experience all of them. Pandas is a gigantic database, a, a gigantic uh, library, and you can do a lot of things with it. I use it for quite a while, and I still discover something new every time. But fortunately, typically, a good handful of commands can bring you very very far away, and you can use it for a lot of different. Uh, different use cases that might not be the primary intention of the developers, but it's so flexible and you can do so many things with it with very few uh, lines of code. And you will find a lot of help, so if you go to Stack Overflow, you find 10,000 questions about pandas and you will find a lot of good answers where you see a whole program written in one line if you feel inclined to do something like this. Okay, um, this was an example I can show way more if you like too, but just give you a feeling. Of course you cannot understand all the details, but maybe it gives you a feeling how powerful this library can be. And you still have 10 minutes, which is good. And uh, because I'm at the conclusions already, so I would recommend to you, if you use Python for certain types of things, look beyond your current Python toolbox and look, look at other people, what other people are doing. And this example is scientists and engineers, and there are a lot, it's a very rich, environment there, a lot of people use it for many different things from astronomy to zoology and you can learn something new and maybe it's just 
of academic interest to know something is there, but sometimes you might find something that's very useful for you, and you can find tools that can solve problems in a very, very unintended way, maybe. So maybe uh, my recommendation is become a cross-field Pythonista. And that's it, and I think, so. thank you very much, and I'm waiting for questions.